Hi everyone, I'm FlygonHG, and this is the video of my attempts at a hardcore nuzlocke of Pokemon Renegade Platinum. To see what I define as hardcore nuzlocke rules, check out the description below. But in short, no items in battle, no overleveling past the gym leader's ace before the start of the battle, and we're playing on set mode. Renegade Platinum is an advanced difficulty catch em all ROM hack of Pokemon Platinum, created by Dreano who is, in my opinion, one of the best ROM hack creators out there, and just a genuinely nice guy. The game is very different from Baseline Platinum, but the gist is that Renegade Platinum features completely revamped and more difficult enemy fights, access to every Pokémon in the National Dex before the Elite Four, and buffs to many Pokémon in the form of increased stats, new typings, revamped movesets, and different abilities. All of these changes combined made for one of the best experiences I've ever had playing a Pokémon game. Of course, like with most ROM hacks, a Renegade Platinum playthrough is much longer than your standard Platinum playthrough. So I'm actually going to be splitting this run into a few videos. This is just part one. I want to make that much clear at the top, but I really hope that you all come along for the ride these next few weeks, because I'm so proud of this playthrough. Even with multiple videos though, I really can't touch on every single battle and every single encounter. So if you're interested in seeing the full run in detail, that's available on my Highlights channel, which summarizes the entire run into 30-minute digestible videos, all in a playlist that is linked in the description. I've also provided a link to Dreano's Poke Community post about Renegade Platinum, where you can download the game and get detailed documentation about all the changes made. You know, speaking of changes, one of the best changes you can make to spice up your life is learning a brand spanking new skill. And what better way to do that than with this video sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community where you can find thousands of classes designed to teach you creative skills, ranging from topics like illustration, graphic design, and video editing. Skillshare is a consistently recurring sponsor of this channel because I believe that so many of their classes are perfect for teaching you the skills you need to be a content creator. I know firsthand because when I was starting out, Everything I learned about video editing with Adobe Premiere Pro is from Jordi Vanderputt's Adobe Premiere Pro for Beginners class. I literally wouldn't have been able to make this video without Jordi's class. And that's just one of the thousands of classes on Skillshare, with new premium classes launched every week. The best part about Skillshare classes is that you can complete them at your own pace and however you want. There's no commitment, you can skip individual lessons if you're not interested, and because Skillshare is focused on learning, all classes are ad-free. Not a luxury we can all afford. So, if you're interested in exploring everything that Skillshare has to offer, the first 1,000 people to click the link in the description below, or use my personal code, will get a one-month trial of Skillshare for free. Thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get into the challenge. But, just as a quick reminder before we start, I play with Species Claws, so I'll be able to reroll encounters until I get a unique encounter, but I can only use one of each unique evolution line. Okay, now let's see how this goes. Although this is a ROM hack, our choice of starters remain the same, so I have to choose between Turtwig, Chimchar, and Piplup. Turtwig has a 50% chance to get the ability Shell Armor, which blocks critical hits and is easily one of, if not the best ability you can have in a Nuzlocke. So the little turtle becomes my first Pokemon, though unfortunately he does not have Shell Armor. Bit of a bummer, but oh well. Once I get to Rowan's lab, I name him Tortellini, and then our journey officially begins. Right away, I head home to tell my mom that I'm leaving for a journey that I will likely never return from. Before I leave, she lets me take an Eevee as my encounter for Twinleaf Town, marking the first of a bunch of really awesome gift Pokémon that have been added to this game. You know what they say, the best Pokémon in life are free. So, with my new Eevee, who I named Eclair, I go to meet Dawn so that she can show me how to catch a Pokémon. Just like she does in Vanilla Platinum, right? It's here that I learn the most important rule of nuzlocking a ROM hack. Always reference the docs. Because had I referenced the docs, I would have seen that Dawn actually challenges me to a battle here. One that I'm not particularly prepared for, because her Piplup is level 9. It seems like attempt 1 might be coming to a pretty premature end. But then this happens. Come on, we just need some crits. Some crit absorbs. Nice. And I'm obviously a great sport about my good luck. Because of that crit, Tortellini is able to survive through the battle and beat Dawn's Piplup, saving attempt 1. But I've now learned my lesson, and the Renegade Platinum docks will quickly become my bible. I know that some people like to play ROM hacks blind, but that's not really what I enjoy most about Nuzlocking. I really like the planning and the theory crafting part of Nuzlocks, so I'd much rather try to beat this in as few attempts as possible, using all the information I have access to. Anyways, now that Dawn has shown me how to catch Pokémon, I start getting a bunch of encounters. But the first is actually another gift Pokémon, 
By heading to Rowan's lab, he lets me take the remaining two Sinnoh starter Pokémon. Of course, because of Nuzlocke rules, I can only use one of them. Since I get both Pokémon more or less at the same time, I decide that I can choose whichever one I want, but I can't look at their natures or abilities beforehand. I decide to go with Chimchar, who I named Sriracha. He has a calm nature and the ability Iron Fist, which is pretty solid. So, next I head to Lake Verity and catch a Surskit named Skittles. That's an Intimidate user when he evolves into Masquerade, so that's not too shabby. I then head to Route 202 and catch a Growlithe named Hot Dog. He has Flash Fire instead of Intimidate. Disappointing, but it's fine. Flash Fire certainly won't come to bite me in the ass, right? In Jubilife City, I can head to the Trainer School where I'm given an egg. This egg will randomly hatch into one of the dozen or so baby Pokémon in the game. So, after a very brief bout of walking, my egg hatches... into a Changeling. Great. I name him Dumpling, and as you can see from his trainer memo, he was hatched in a location called the Trainer School. There are a few instances in this game where Dreano has created new areas to allow for more encounters per standard Nuzlocke rules. This means that I can also select one of the Kanto starters that are gifted to me in the Jubilife Pokémon Center. I pick Charmander, who I named Chili. He has a modest nature, which is great. On Route 218, I fish up a Finneon, who I name Nchips. Finneon is an example of one of the many Pokémon that got a solid stat buff, so this isn't as terrible of an encounter as it seems. On Route 204, I catch a Budu named Chickpea, which is a great early game encounter. And in Ravage Path, I catch a Psyduck, who I named Foy Grass. So, now I've got a solid number of Pokémon and a decent number of different typings to play with. Plus, I even have a few extra grass, water, and fire types in case we lose any. But that's not gonna happen. This now leads to the first actual fight against our rival Famine on Route 203. And it also happens to be the game's first major run-ender because he has a Munchlax. And here is where I learned the other most important rule about nuzlocking a ROM hack. Never underestimate anything. Famine leads with a Starly, and I lead with Chili, thinking that he'll be able to easily take care of this little chicken with no problem. But then Starly outspeeds us and hits a wing attack that brings Chili into the yellow. Ember then does about 40%. So no, Chili is definitely not easily taking care of Starly. Idiot. Now another wing attack might leave Chili with 1 HP, but a high roll could just kill him. Not to mention there's the chance of a critical hit. So I switch to Eclair, who takes 12 damage from a wing attack, which is much better. I'm still at risk to a critical hit, but I have no choice here. A second wing attack doesn't crit, so we hit Starly with a Covet, which leaves him with a Sliver. Bummer. I do have Quick Attack, but I have to assume that this Starly does too, so I can't stay in. I decide to switch to Skittles, who can hopefully tank a Quick Attack, and then outspeed and finish off Starly on the next turn. But unfortunately, Famine heals with a Potion, which I wasn't expecting at all. Good to know that the AI heals. But now I've got a bug type in on a fully healthy Starly, so I have to switch to in Chips, who takes 12 damage from a wing attack. We outspeed to hit Starly with a water pulse, but it's not enough for the kill, so Starly nails us with another wing attack. Then I switch to Sriracha on a quick attack. Starly hits one more strong wing attack to bring Sriracha into the red before going down to an ember. That was just one of Famine's Pokemon. This is going very poorly. Munchlax is next, so I switch to Tortellini on a Rock Tomb, which crits. Yikes. Munchlax now outspeeds, so he gets off an Amnesia before Tortellini hits a Razor Leaf, which crits. Nice. Tortellini is holding a Scope Lens that we picked up in Jubilife Trainer School. Munchlax then hits us with a Tackle, which leaves Tortellini with 3 HP. That activates our Overgrow, but even so, Munchlax hangs on with what appears to be exactly 1 HP. I decide to switch Tortellini to Nchips for a sacrifice, but before I do, Famian actually decides to switch Munchlax out to Chimchar, so it seems like the AI can switch as well. Also good to know. Now, Nchips is able to outspeed Chimchar, but even with a held Expert Belt, a Water Pulse leaves Chimchar with a Sliver, and he restores some HP with an Orange Berry. And then an Ember fries Nchips, marking the very first death of the run. May Nchips live forever in our hearts. His sacrifice lets me bring in Skittles, though, who finishes off Chimchar with a Water Pulse. And then once Chimchar goes down, Munchlax comes out, and also gets killed by a Water Pulse, which does win us the battle. That was a really good wake-up call. I learned a lot from that battle that'll be helpful for the rest of the playthrough. Mistakes were made, but in the grand scheme of things, if I had to lose a Pokémon to learn a few lessons, then Finneon is an okay one to lose. The show must go on. So I head back to where Nchips was murdered, and I catch a Bidoof named Taco. 
See, water types are like a dime a dozen. We'll be fine. In Orberg Gate, I catch a Zubat, who I named Cake Batter. Probat is a phenomenal Pokémon normally, and Dreano actually buffed her level up moveset to include egg moves like Brave Bird and Crunch, so this is an absolutely fantastic encounter. One of the last few encounters before I have to fight against the first gym leader is a Gift Beldum that I get from Steven Stone in Orberg City. Shouldn't you be at home looking after your half-brother, Steven? I name Beldum Jawbreaker, and they're another incredible addition to the team, though it does mean that I can't get one of the Hoenn starters from the Orber Pokemon Center. On Route 206, I catch a Machop named Flesh, and in Orber Mine, I catch an Aeron named Salt. I was hoping for a Trap Pinch here, but Aeron is phenomenal as far as second choices go. So now it's Rourke time. Here's his team in this game. As you'll notice, it's much, much better than in regular Platinum. Though as far as ROM hacks go, Dreano is kind enough to ease us into the difficulty a bit here. Things will be getting much harder. We have a good number of Pokémon that are pretty well equipped to handle Rourke, so this shouldn't be too bad. He leads with a purebred Nosepass, which likes to spread Paralysis with Thunder Wave and set up Stealth Rocks or Sandstorm. So I lead with Sriracha, who has evolved into Monferno and Nose Taunt, which instantly stops Nosepass's shenanigans. Then I switch to Chickpea, who has evolved into Roselia on a soft critical hit Shockwave, which is Nosepass's only attacking move. This makes it pretty easy to set up a few growths with Chickpea, though Nosepass's Taunt wears off after a single growth. So I just Mega Drain the Nose Pass, which is enough to knock him out, and get Chickpea back to full HP. Geodude is second, and also goes down to a single Mega Drain. But then Cranidos is third, and no Zen Headbutt. And unfortunately, Chickpea doesn't outspeed, so I have to switch to Jawbreaker, who shrugs it off. Then on the next turn, I get hit by a hard Thunder Punch that would have just straight up killed them if it crit. But since it didn't, Jawbreaker fires off an Iron Head, which one shots Cranidos. So fourth is Onyx, who knows Bulldoze, and has also been gifted an attack buff in this game. So I switch to Dumpling, who has evolved into Chimeco and is immune to Bulldoze thanks to Levitate. Dumpling then hits Onyx with a hard confusion as he sets up a Stealth Rock. It seems to be a speed tie here because Onyx now outspeeds and sets up a Sandstorm, which gives him the special defense buff and lets him survive a second confusion. Rourke then heals, so another confusion does a bit of damage as the Sandstorm rages. Onyx then hits Dumpling with a Rock Tomb for a bit of damage, as a Confusion brings him into the yellow. I am at risk to a crit here, so I have to switch to Flesh, who resists Stealth Rocks and a Rock Tomb, and then takes a bit of damage from Sandstorm. He now baits Bulldoze, so I go into Tortellini now, who takes some more Stealth Rock Chip, and then brushes off a Bulldoze as the Sandstorm fades. Onyx then chooses to set up another Sandstorm, so an Absorb from Tortellini finishes off the Phallic Rock Monster. Fifth is Larvitar, which has a Flame Orb and Guts so I switch to Chickpea as he attempts to protect. Then the Flame Orb activates, burning Larvitar and giving him that attack boost. Larvitar then chooses to protect again, which does nothing but make him take some chip damage from burn. So, on the next turn, Chickpea hits a Mega Drain, which finishes Larvitar off. And then last is Bonsly. He has a Rhindo Berry and the boost from Sandstorm, so a single Mega Drain does just a little bit of damage. But then he just misses a rollout. To be fair, Bonsly does not look like he would roll particularly well. Like, does he roll on his side? He looks really bottom heavy, meaning that I think he would curve quite a bit if he rolled. Like, that'd be pretty tough to line up. Anyways, a few more Mega Drains take out Bonsly and win us the very first Gym Badge of Renegade Platinum. So now it's off to Floroma Town, where I can get one of the three Johto starters. I decide on Chikorita, because in this game, Meganium is part Fairy type, and I can potentially get Serene Grace as an ability. Pear does have Serene Grace, but I actually end up never really using this Pokémon. Sorry, Meganium fans. Then I head to Valley Windworks, where I catch a Drifloon named Grape. In general, Drifloon is a phenomenal Pokémon for pivoting since he has three immunities, so this is a great encounter. I can also head to Floroma Meadows and get an encounter from a Honey Tree there. In this game, Honey triggers an instant encounter. My encounter is a Shroomish, which is pretty good. Welcome to the team, Quiche. Then, on Route 205, I decide to fish for an encounter, which turns out to be a Magikarp. Gyarados is obviously a phenomenal Pokémon, to the point where people will often ban it from Nuzlocks. However, because this is my first ROM hack, I decided that it was fine to use any encounter I get, other than Legendaries. So, Chicken joins the team. At this point, I also decide to evolve Eclair the Eevee into Umbreon. Umbreon is a really consistent choice for an evolution because of his bulk and the ability to support your team with Wish, Moonlight, and Toxic Stall. So unless you desperately need a Pokémon with the typing of one of the other evolutions, Umbreon is usually a pretty safe default evolution to go with. 
Next up is the fight against Mars and Valley Windworks, but we've got a lot to cover, so she's gonna get cut for time. As is the fight against Cheryl in Eterna Forest. One of the many things that Drayano added to the game is that prior to joining up with characters like Cheryl, Mira, and Riley, you have to actually fight them. Cheryl isn't particularly difficult though, which means I safely make it to Eterna City. And once I've dumped her off there, I head back to Eterna Forest to catch a Buneary named Peeps. Lopunny is significantly buffed in this game, including getting the normal fighting type like her Mega. So this is actually a really solid encounter. I've been mentioning every single encounter so far, but from here on out, I'll be skipping ones that I have nothing to say about. I can now head into the old chateau where I get the static Rotom encounter. As soon as I have access to the galactic building in Eterna City, I'll be able to freely change Rotom's form, meaning that this single encounter gives me access to electric types that sport water, grass, fire, flying, or ice as a secondary typing. Pop Rocks is an incredibly versatile encounter. While in the old chateau, I pick up the TM for Substitute. In Renegade Platinum, TMs are effectively reusable, similar to how they are in later generations of Pokemon. However, in spite of all the really awesome changes that were made to this game, including vastly superior and more difficult enemy AI, Substitute still throws the AI for a loop. If you've ever used Substitute in a baseline Pokemon game, you may have seen what I'm talking about. The enemy AI just can't recognize whether the player has a Substitute up, meaning that oftentimes the AI will repeatedly just use status moves into a Substitute, which obviously fail over and over and over again. This makes setup strats really, really easy to pull off. And one could argue that's even more true in this game, where many enemies have sets entirely designed around non-damaging moves. So, for that reason, I decided to ban Substitute from this playthrough. There are plenty of other AI logic abusing strategies that I will be employing, but I felt that Substitute was just a bridge too far. Remember, this is all just personal preference though. Do what you want, but don't judge other people. It's a made up rule set. Before I'm allowed to face Gardenia, I actually have to take a detour all the way to the snowy Route 216 to go find her. Along the way, I fish up a Feebas from the basement of Mount Cornet named Unagi. Feebas is a phenomenal and guaranteed encounter. Then, on Route 216, I find a Smoochum, but it can't be a Flygon HG video without at least one completely unexplainable misplay. Oh no! Whoops. I mean, at least it was a Smoochum. That's not the worst encounter to lose. But okay, that means it's time for Gardenia, who has another stacked team. She leads with Blossom, and I lead with Cake Batter, who has fully evolved into a beautiful Crobat. Just like with Rourke, Gardenia's lead likes to mess around with non-attacking moves, so I immediately use Taunt to stop the Stun Spore. Then I switch to Chickpea, who takes very little damage, even from a critical hit Dazzling Gleam. So far, this is exactly what happened against Rourke. Down to the crit. Weird. I set up a layer of Toxic Spikes on the next turn, as Blossom hits another Dazzling Gleam. Again, our opponent's Taunt wears off early. I decide to set up another layer of spikes as Blossom then hits a Stun Spore, which connects. Then I switch to Cake Batter, who unfortunately gets hit by a Teeter Dance on the switch. So I go back to Chickpea, whose Nature Cure ability has healed her Paralysis. Though another Stun Spore fixes that right away. Blossom then hits a Teeter Dance, but Chickpea breaks through the Confusion and the Paralysis to hit Blossom with a Hard Sludge. So I switch to Cake Batter, who then gets hit by another nonsense Teeter Dance. Predicted, I guess. Okay, well it's back to Chickpea, who again gets stun spored. Then I switch back to Cake Batter, who finally doesn't get hit by a Teeter Dance on the switch. This means we can now safely hit Blossom with another taunt. Doesn't really matter though, because an 80 base power Leech Life finishes off the Tiny Dancer on the next turn. Roserade comes in second, so unfortunately setting up Toxic Spikes was a complete waste of time. She has extra sensory, so I switch to Jawbreaker, who is now a Matang. A Magical Leaf then does a bit of damage on the next turn, as Jawbreaker connects with the ever-scary 90% accurate Zen Headbutt. A Citrus Berry activates, meaning that I have to go for another Zen Headbutt. It seems like the previous Magical Leaf was a low roll, because Roserade hits another one here that would have killed if it crit. But for the second gym in a row, Jawbreaker is a survivor, and they are able to finish off Roserade with one more Zen Headbutt. Cherim comes out next, so I switch to Sriracha, who gets hit by a Soft Grass Knot. I use Fake Out for a bit of chip damage, since it always causes a flinch. Then, Gardenia's little idiot uses Sunny Day, so a sun-boosted flame wheel easily kills her in one shot. Fourth is Grodel with Bulldoze. So I switch to Cake Batter. He actually comes in on a Leech Seed, which thankfully misses. If that hit, that would have made things a bit harder. But since it missed, I can Taunt Grodel, meaning that Grodel can only hit Cake Batter with a 4x resisted Seed Bomb, 
as we kill him with two aerial aces. Seriously, Crobat is an amazing Pokemon. Next is Tangela, who has Ancient Power and Shockwave. So I switch to Eclair on a Stun Spore, which actually misses. I Sand Attack the next turn, but then Tangela actually does connect, though at least Synchronize also paralyzes Tangela. So I can set up a Wish, as Eclair takes a bit of damage from Grass Knot and recovers with Leftovers. Then I switch to Chickpea as Tangela gets fully paralyzed, and Eclair's Wish brings our Sentient Rose back to full HP. I set up another layer of Toxic Spikes here, so that Tangela will paralyze Chickpea with a Stun Spore. I'll explain why in a sec. This is a little risky, because it means that on the next turn, if an Ancient Power Omni Boost happens, things would get really bad. Though thankfully, with the Paralysis and the Sand Attack Accuracy drop, the odds of getting that Omni Boost are really, really low. It doesn't happen, so a Sludge just finishes off Tangela. And last is Breloom, who gets poisoned as she comes in. Since Chickpea got paralyzed by Tangela, Breloom will now never go for Spore, meaning that I can safely switch to Cake Batter, who easily tanks a critical hit Mach Punch. Then, an Aerial Ace finishes off Breloom, winning us another Deathless Gym Badge. At this point, I have to head to the Team Galactic Eterna building to save the owner of the Eterna City Bike Shop who according to Bulbapedia is named Rad Rickshaw. Neat. I already have a bike though, because you get it at the very start of the game in Renegade Platinum, so there's really no motivation for saving this guy, other than the fact that I guess it's like, kind of the right thing to do. So this pits us against Jupiter, who even in regular Platinum is pretty scary. But before that, there's this guy, with a Ladian and an Ariados. Uh... Alright, well, I wonder what you have. Oh, okay, you're the one with Ladian. Got it. It's <sighs> a lot of damage. 22. Dude, what the... what the crap? <laughs> Bounce has 85% accuracy, so the odds of a double miss into a crit is about 0.3%. But that's what I get for using Bounce. An absolutely terrible move. Well, time for Jupiter, I guess. She leads with a Golbat, and I lead with Pop Rocks. A Shockwave hits Golbat hard, and then a Giga Drain does a bit of damage in return. I actually meant to turn Pop Rocks into his Microwave form here, but I forgot. A second Shockwave finishes off Golbat. Sableye comes out next. She got a bunch of buffs, so she actually could be pretty scary, if it wasn't for the fact that I have Peeps, who is immune to her Ghost-type attacks. Peep also has the ability Scrappy, meaning that she's able to fake out Sableye for a good chunk of damage. Then a super effective Rock Smash leaves Sableye in the red which activates a Citrus Berry. Fortunately, a knockoff doesn't do much damage, though it does mean that we no longer have a Silk Scarf. A second Rock Smash finishes off Sableye. So third is Jupiter's very scary Skun Tank. I switch to Salt, who has evolved into a Lairon and is immune to Poison Jab. The type matchups have been updated to reflect later generations, so Steel no longer resists Dark-type moves, meaning that Salt will still take a decent amount of damage from Night Slash, especially if Skun Tank crits, which is more likely now that she's used Focus Energy. Dig also doesn't do as much damage as I was hoping, but I decide that it's best to stay in again and go for another one. Skun Tank just wastes a turn using Torment here too. So, in a stroke of luck, a second Dig from Salt crits into Skun Tank and kills her. Then, Poppy comes in to show her support and bless the rest of the battle as Jupiter's final Pokemon, Tangela, comes in. So I switch to my go-to Tangela killer, Chickpea, and tank a Giga Drain. Tangela then outspeeds and hits a Sleep Powder, but I came prepared for this as a Chesto Berry cures my sleep. Then, a Sludge gets a clean one-shot, winning us the battle. So, no deaths to Commander Jupiter and her Skun Tank, but Gyarados dies to a random Grunt with two Bug types. Sure. Well, as a reward for saving his life, the awesomely named Rad Rickshaw gives me a Porygon. So I guess it was in my own personal interest to save this guy after all. The Galactic Building counts as a separate encounter from Eterna City, by the way. So we'll still be able to come back and fish something up from the Eastern Pond a bit later. I also get an egg from Cynthia, which just like in regular Platinum, hatches into a Togepi. And since Drayano is a bro, 
Rad Rickshaw's cycling shop also counts as a separate location from Eterna City. So welcome to the team, Omelet. Similarly, the museum in Orberg City is a separate location as well, so I can revive a fossil there for another encounter. I have my choice of any of the fossil Pokémon, since a scientist in Eterna City gave me all of them. I decide on Anorith, which has the potential to have the ability Battle Armor, which like with Shell Armor, prevents crits. Unfortunately, my Anorith, named Enchilada, has Swift Swim. Oh well. But up next is arguably one of the most important encounters in the entire game. On Route 206, there is a chance to catch Gligar. Gligar's evolution, Glysaur, is one of the best Pokémon in the game. And in this game, Glysaur has a 50% chance to have the ability Poison Heal, which restores an eighth of Glysaur's HP every turn if Glysaur is poisoned, effectively making Glysaur the best physical wall and the best setup sweeper in the entire game. And fortunately, you can actually guarantee encountering a Gligar on Route 206 if you manipulate the encounter using repels. Often called repel manipping, this is a very common strategy in harder Nuzlocks. Essentially, by leading with a Pokémon that is higher leveled than most of the Pokémon on the route, but lower leveled than a few, you can use a repel to drastically change the potential encounters. And in this case, by using a level 22 lead Pokémon, it guarantees Gligar. A fellow content creator, Drew, put together a comprehensive list of many of the useful repel manips in Renegade Platinum, and I've included a link to that document in the description below. Be sure to check out Drew's YouTube and Twitch channels, by the way. The man is an absolute legend at ROM hacks, and he makes me just look like I'm randomly mashing buttons. Anyways, I win the coin flip, and Chorizo manages to have the ability Immunity, which will turn into Poison Heal upon evolution. I'm a freaking dork. From here, there's a few mandatory mini-boss fights against Mira in Wayward Cave and Dawn on Route 207. Both end up being deathless wins. Along the way, I get the static Gabite named Soup from Wayward Cave, though he won't be useful until he evolves into Garchomp. And even then, I don't end up using him as much as I thought I would. I don't know. Maybe I have a Garchomp bias. I also end up never using the Skitty I catch on Route 208, though that one is probably less surprising. Even in a ROM hack, Jellybean is a certified grade A bench warmer. Before getting to Hearth Home City, there's one more mini boss to fight, and it's none other than the Elite Four member, Aaron. If I was playing this ROM hack blind, I'm completely certain that I would wipe here. His scope lens sniper Drapion is disgusting, especially this early in the game, and essentially ensures a wipe if you don't come prepared to deal with him. Even if you do know about this battle, it's a pretty well-known run-ender. Fortunately, Aaron leads with a Dustox that can be cheesed with the proper team. I lead with Omelette, who has evolved into Togetic. Dustox uses Toxic to poison Omelette, but the poison is healed with a held Petra Berry which lets Omelette get a free Encore into Dustox. Then I switch to Salt, who is obviously immune from getting poisoned. This lets her set up a Stealth Rock for free. Then Salt starts using Captivate to lower Dustox's special attack, as he slowly burns through his Toxic PP. Once his Encore ends, I switch back to Omelette. Then I let Omelette get hit by another Toxic, so that I can get off a second Encore. After switching to Salt, Dustox's Encore ends, indicating that he has completely ran out of all 10 of his Toxic PP. So I switch back to Omelette as Dustox now tries to go for Protect. This lets me set up a Wish as Omelette just takes a bit more poison damage. Then I switch to my good pup Hot Dog, who prior to being evolved was perfectly molded into an Aaron sweeping machine. As Dustox just goes for Protects, Hot Dog sets up an agility for a speed boost, and then sets up 6 Howls. After that, Flame Wheel sweeps Aaron's entire team. The Stealth Rock set up by Salt breaks Beautifly's Focus Sash, and the agility ensures that we outspeed Drapion. So, the infamous run ender that is Renegade Platinum Aaron ends up being bested by one floofy puppy. With an assist from Salt and Omelette, of course. With that, it's time for gym battle number three against Fantina, who does have a very scary team. Remember that Drew fella I mentioned a second ago? Well, he came up with a pretty ingenious strategy against Renegade Platinum Fantina that involves leading with a male Umbreon and captivating her lead Driftblim. The idea is that this Driftblim will use Calm Mind and eventually baton pass to Miss Magius. And thanks to Captivate dropping her special attack faster than Calm Mind can boost it, Miss Magius comes in with really great special defense, but very low special attack. And from there, you can easily set up with Shell Armor Torterra, who can't be crit. Only issue is that I don't have a Shell Armor Torterra, so I'll need to improvise a bit, or get lucky and avoid some crits, which would bypass the special attack drops. 
So Fantina starts things off great with an air slash that crits Eclair and also causes a flinch. For the record, that is now the third gym in a row where the gym leader's first damaging move was a critical hit. Fortunately, the next air slash doesn't flinch or crit, so we get off a of captivate. Then Driftblim starts going for Calm Minds as I first make sure to stay healthy with Moonlight and then start spamming Captivates. By the time Driftblim goes for Baton Pass, she's at minus three special attack. So with one more Captivate as Miss Magius comes in, she's now sitting at minus five. Time to dodge some crits. I switch first to Omelette on a Dazzling Gleam, which does very little damage. Miss Magius then hits a Power Gem, which thankfully doesn't crit since it likely would have killed. This lets Omelette get off a Yawn. Then I switch to Taco, who is now a Bibarel. She tanks a non-critical hit power gem as Miss Magius falls asleep. Thanks to Taco's ability simple, stat boosts are doubled, so two sword stances are enough to get to plus six. Unfortunately, Miss Magius does get the one turn sleep, so we do get hit by another Dazzling Gleam. As you can tell, I really haven't perfected playing around the critical hit in this ROM hack yet. But now that Taco is at plus six attack, a priority Aqua Jet is enough to one-shot Miss Magius. Gengar comes in second and also goes down to an Aqua Jet. Those are her two strongest Pokemon taken care of. Spiritum is next, and she's bulky enough that an Aqua Jet doesn't kill, so I go for Aqua Tail. It's a bit risky because Aqua Tail can miss, but I'm not punished, and Spiritum falls. Bainet is next, and she's frail enough to fall to a priority Aqua Jet. So fifth is the Drift Blim that Fantina led with, which I kind of forgot about. An Aqua Jet isn't a guaranteed kill, and a critical hit Air Slash could kill Taco here, but I haven't lost a Pokemon since Chicken went down to that dumb Ladian, and I'm feeling pretty full of myself. So I really have no one to blame but myself when Aqua Jet leaves Drift Blim with a sliver, causing Drift Blim's Starf Berry to activate, which randomly gives Drift Blim a plus two boost to one of her five stats. The stat it happens to boost? Special Attack. So, sweet little Taco goes down. But that's what you get for having an attack IV of two, Taco. Well, I bring in Cake Batter here and Fantina heals, meaning that a Crunch doesn't one-shot the Drift Blim either. I'm actually really lucky that Fantina healed here, because I completely forgot that because of the Starf Berry activating, Drift Blim's Unburden has activated as well, meaning that she now outspeeds Cake Batter. Fortunately, Twitch Chat does remind me, so I switch to Eclair. But then Driftblim just uses Baton Pass to give Dusclops the special attack boost, which is a horrendous move on Fantina's part since Dusclops' only attacking move is Shadow Punch. So Umbreon is safe to hit Dusclops with a Crunch, which gets a defense drop, as she goes for a burn with Will-O-Wisp that is reciprocated thanks to Synchronize. So then I switch to Cake Batter on a Pain Split. This is a bit annoying, but ultimately it's fine. I taunt Dusclops on the next turn so that she can't burn us, though she just goes for a Shadow Punch. Then a crunch, plus burn damage, is enough to kill Dusclops on the next turn. So last is the Drift Blim for a third time, but now we safely outspeed and kill the Haunted Blimp with one last crunch. That was a sloppy, sloppy battle, but I'm still getting my sea legs in this ROM hack, and it is only attempt one. So I'm actually pretty happy that I've managed to get three badges with only three deaths. Well, after that, it's time for one of the more interesting additions to Renegade Platinum. Before moving on to Salacian Town and beyond, I have to clear out Team Galactic from the Pokemon Mansion on Route 212. There's some pretty unique things here, like a challenge where you have to beat three Galactic Grunts with a Ninkata, a Ninjask, and a Shedinja in exactly six turns. The Ninjask has a Focus Sash that I wasn't expecting, and uh... That was close. This little subplot culminates in a double battle against Saturn and Mr. Backlot, who both have three pretty powerful Pokemon. What makes this extra difficult is that it's a multi-battle with my rival. The multi-battle AI can be pretty unpredictable. Sometimes they're incredibly helpful, and other times they're aggressively useless. And figuring out how to play with them is a very particular type of battling that I honestly don't have much experience with. So this is a valuable, but dangerous, learning experience. Saturn and Backlot lead with a Bronzong and a Wigglytuff. I lead with Hot Dog and Famine sends out his Staravia. I start with a Flame Wheel into Bronzong, which leaves them with a Sliver. Then Staravia sets up a Double Team, which is completely useless because Wigglytuff takes him out with a Thunderbolt. Bronzong hits a pretty hard send Headbutt, recovers some HP with Leftovers, and then Famine brings out Monferno. I Flame Wheel Bronzong to take them out, which causes Monferno's Low Kick to be redirected into Wigglytuff, who is pretty light and also part Fairy type, so that does basically nothing. Wigglytuff then hits a very hard Hyper Voice, which leaves Hot Dog very low on HP, 
and activates Monferno Citrus Berry. As Saturn brings in Octillery, it's painfully obvious to anyone with eyes that I can't stay in with Hot Dog here. So I switch to Washing Machine Pop Rocks. And then Famine, in all his infinite wisdom, decides that it's a good idea to flamethrower into Pop Rocks instead of attacking our opponents. Now, to be fair, he was trying to activate Hot Dog's Flash Fire ability, but still, that is aggressively stupid and very frustrating, because we could really use that flamethrower damage on Wigglytuff. Pop Rocks also has to tank a Thunderbolt from Wigglytuff, which isn't great, though at least an Octazooka from Octillery misses. On the next turn, I give Famine a taste of his own medicine and go for Discharge, which manages to crit into Famine's Monferno, so he dies. I do get another crit on Wigglytuff and a Paralysis on Octillery, but now that Monferno is dead and he doesn't get an attack off, both of my opponent's Pokémon are alive and their attacks get redirected into Pop Rocks, so the double up kills them. There's a lot to unpack in those last two turns. Tons of RNG, some in my favor, most not, but it is hard to look at the cumulative effect of it all and not want to strangle my rival with his own stupid little scarf until the life leaves his eyes. I honestly don't even know if the flamethrower damage onto Wigglytuff would have been enough to kill her, or if a non-critical hit discharge wouldn't have killed Monferno, but I'm gonna choose to be super salty about it, because it is so much easier to blame bad AI than it is to accept that this was my fault. No, I mean, I know that it wasn't a great play, but again, I'm still learning how to manage this ROM hack. Losing Rotom is easily the worst death so far, though. Except maybe Gyarados. Oh, and for those of you keeping score at home, that's now four deaths, all of them water types. Anyways, I bring in Dumpling next as Famine brings out Heracross. Even he can't screw up this turn. A Bug Bite kills Octillery, and then a Psychic from Dumpling kills Wigglytuff. Toxicroak is last for Saturn, and Raichu is second for Backlot. The two newcomers both use Fake Out, so our side of the field flinches. Then, Raichu uses the chaotically neutral Teeter Dance, which confuses everyone else on the field, including Toxicroak. And then, everyone hits themselves in confusion. Honestly, I'll take it. Raichu then hits Dumpling with a pretty hard Thunderbolt. Toxicroak hits herself in confusion again. Heracross hits himself in confusion again. But Dumpling breaks through and one-shots Toxicroak with a Psychic. It's easy to harp on bad RNG, but it's really important to remember good RNG as well. So now it's a 2v1, which is generally the best way to handle these multi-battles. Target down one side of the field so that you get the numbers advantage. So I switch to Tortellini, but Raichu goes for another nonsensical teeter dance, which confuses him on the switch. And then Famine's idiot Heracross hits himself in confusion for the third time in a row. I stay in as Raichu kills the low IQ Heracross with a Thunderbolt. Then Tortellini comes in clutch and kills Raichu with an Earthquake through confusion. Famine brings in Snorlax as Backlot sends out his last Pokémon, Espeon. I switch out to Jawbreaker, who tanks a critical hit Psychic. And then Famine finally does something useful and kills Espeon with a critical hit Body Slam, winning us the battle. Doesn't make up for that lousy flamethrower play, but it's a start. After a decent amount of self-pity, I set my sight on some new encounters. First, from Backlot's Trophy Garden, I catch a Pikachu named Cheese. Electric types are pretty rare, so this is a decent encounter, especially considering that my only other electric type just died at the hands of my supposed ally. I also head back to Eterna City and fish up a Poliwag. I was thinking of delaying this encounter in case I got a Poliwag dupe later, since that would then guarantee Dratini here, but I changed my mind. Lollipop has Water Absorb, which turns into Drizzle if I evolve her into Politoed, so this is an amazing encounter. Then, from Route 212, I catch a Staravia. This is an incredibly important encounter. Not because Staravia is that good, I mean, it can be. Even though Ham doesn't have Intimidate, Reckless means that he can theoretically dish out very strong Brave Birds. But much more importantly, because of Species Claws, Ham means that we can now guarantee a Chansey from Route 209 with Repel Manips. This is incredible, because Blissey is arguably the best Pokémon for Nuzlocking. Her monstrous HP and very good special defense makes her the best special wall in the game. Add the fact that she can learn Soft Boiled for recovery, and Seismic Toss for consistent damage, and you've got a Pokémon that trivializes almost any enemy Pokémon that only has special attacking moves. Any Pokémon that has a single physical move can usually one-shot Blissey with a crit, but there are many, many special attacking only Pokémon in this ROM hack that are incredibly scary, and we will be using Egg for almost every single one of them. 
Again, it's my first ROM hack, so anything goes for this run, and that includes using a busted Pokemon like Blissey. But what it does not include is EV training. Once you get to Salacian Town, there are a few NPCs that allow you to easily EV train your Pokemon if you want to, which can give your Pokemon drastic increases in their stats, making it much easier to fight against enemy Pokemon that don't have any EV investments at all. But because I have access to so many good encounters, I decided that I would not be specifically EV training my Pokemon. That way the challenge becomes more about team building and less about brute forcing my way through fights with a bunch of roided out monsters. If it wasn't already clear, I'm also using rare candies to level up my Pokemon. To save time, yes, but also to avoid the EVs you'd accrue from grinding on wild Pokemon. Anyways, once I get past Salacian Town, I repel Manip to increase the odds of getting a Scyther on Route 210. And it works perfectly. Until Salt kills him with a critical hit Iron Head. I really wasn't expecting a critical hit to kill. In order for that to happen, this Scyther would have to have pretty terrible defense and HP IVs. But missing out on a Steel type is obviously a huge bummer. From here, I can head south of Veilstone and grab a Razor Fang, which I can use to evolve Chorizo into Glysaur, which is right in time for the fight against Maylene for the fourth gym badge. Her team is really, really scary. I think I've said that about every single gym leader. She has a huge power Metacham, a Toxic Orb Guts Machamp, and a few other powerful Pokemon, but the main threat is her Lucario which in a fit of psychosis, Dreano gave the ability Adaptability to. Adaptability means that Lucario's stab moves deal double damage instead of the standard 1.5, so if you can't kill Lucario quickly, you're in trouble. And that's extra difficult because Lucario has a Focus Sash. Fortunately, this is the perfect opportunity for Chorizo to show how good of a Pokemon he can be, as long as we're careful to not have Lucario come out too early in the battle. I lead with Unagi into Maylene's Medicham. She gets flinched by a fake out, which does decent chip damage. But then, thanks to a choice scarf, we outspeed and one shot Medicham with a stab Moonblast. Thanks to her fairy typing, this brings in Toxicroak, who has a stab super effective poison jab. So I switch to Jawbreaker, who's immune. Now, the issue is that this Toxicroak knows priority Sucker Punch, which theoretically is the most damage into Jawbreaker. So I want to try and stall him out of Sucker Punches by going for non attacking moves that will make Sucker Punch fail. Unfortunately, the AI seems to be kinda weird about when it uses Sucker Punch, so Toxicroak actually just goes for Drain Punch as I set up a Stealth Rock. Though that at least takes care of Lucario's Focus Sash. Drain Punch did do a lot of damage though, so I have to switch back to Unagi, which causes Toxicroak's Sucker Punch to fail. But now, I can freely switch back to Jawbreaker on Poison Jabs for a few turns, as Leftovers slowly heals back some HP. Even when Toxicroak goes for Drain Punch, Unagi doesn't take too much damage, so this is relatively safe for at least a few turns. Ideally, Toxicroak wastes all her Sucker Punch PP here, but she doesn't. So after a few turns, I decide I kinda just have to risk the crit. Jawbreaker survives a Drain Punch as Toxicroak goes down to a Psychic. Now you might be asking why I didn't just switch to Cake Batter the Crobat on a Drain Punch. Well, Crobat is a very good Pokemon for pivoting and dealing quick damage, but she's not all that strong. An Aerial Ace just doesn't one-shot Toxicroak, and then she'd be able to retaliate with an Ice Punch. But also, by killing with Jawbreaker, this baits in Infernape. This lets me safely switch to Hot Dog, who's immune to Fire Punch thanks to Flash Fire. I guess it's a blessing and a curse. This baits Infernape to use Close Combat. So I can now switch to Cake Batter, who tanks that just fine. And now thanks to the Defense Drop from Close Combat, an Aerial Ace one-shots Infernape. This is perfect, because Cake Batter now baits in Gallade, who has Stab super effective Zen Headbutt. This lets me switch to Eclair, who is of course immune to Zen Headbutt. And now, we're in a good position to start setting up with Chorizo, who comes in as Gallade sets up a Reflect. I start by setting up a Rock Polish to outspeed Maylene's Lucario. Then, I set up a Sword Stance. Once Gallade hits a Zen Headbutt, you can really see the insane amount of HP Chorizo recovers from a combination of Poison Heal and Leftovers. As long as Gallade doesn't get two critical hits in a row, I can safely roost up until Gallade's Reflect runs out. He actually manages to miss a Zen Headbutt after a few turns, so I can use that opportunity to get off another Sword Stance and get Chorizo up to plus four, which is now enough to kill Maylene's Machamp. Since Gallade is holding a Light Clay, Reflect lasts for eight turns, so after a few more turns of stalling out Reflect, Chorizo kills Gallade with an Earthquake. Machamp comes in next and goes for a Protect on turn one to activate his Toxic Orb. Doesn't matter though, because an Earthquake on the next turn is a one-shot. Last is the terrifying Lucario, but now that his Focus Sash is broken, plus four Earthquake is more than enough to take him out in one shot, winning us the fourth Gym Badge. 
There's not too too much between the 4th and 5th gyms, other than a bunch of encounters, some of which are really really great. I start by backtracking to Route 215 to get a Honey Tree encounter. I'm hoping for a Munchlax, but it's an Apom. And then on Route 213, I get a Pelipper. With Drizzle, which our Pelipper, whose name is Pepper, does have, Pelipper is one of the best encounters I could have gotten here. When caused by an ability, weather is permanent in this game. So having a Pokemon that can instantly set up rain is incredible, especially when fighting opposing weather teams. Now it's time for the fight against Famine in front of Pastoria City. The last few fights against him have been pretty easy, but now that his Pokemon are fully evolved, things are a bit scarier. He leads with his Staraptor, and I lead with Cheese the Raichu. Unfortunately, Cheese has a speed IV of 4, meaning that he doesn't outspeed Staraptor without a Choice Scarf. This is unfortunate, because Cheese also has an Adamant Nature, which is minus special attack. So Thunderbolt isn't a guaranteed kill without holding an item like a Magnet, for example. So, sadly, a Choice Scarf Cheese fires off a Thunderbolt that leaves Famine Staraptor with just a sliver, and then he gets killed by a Double Edge. In the past, I've said that natures don't matter in regular Nuzlocks, but they absolutely do in ROM hacks. There goes my last electric type, right before Crasher Wake. Double Edge Recoil does kill Staraptor, so when I bring in Chorizo, Famine brings in Snorlax. So I start setting up. One of the best things about pre-poisoning Chorizo with Toxic Heal is that he can't be statused by moves like Body Slam. But I do pretty quickly realize that I'm risking a critical hit here, so I decide to switch to Grape, who has evolved into Drift Blim. Then I go back to Chorizo on a Crunch, who recovers most of the damage dealt. Then I go for a Fly. In Renegade Platinum, Fly has 100 base power and 100% accuracy, so it's a pretty disgusting move, especially when paired with passive recovery from Leftovers and Poison Heal. This does a bit of chip damage to Snorlax and slowly wastes his Body Slam PP while keeping Chorizo out of critical hit range. I do this whole thing one more time. Switch to Grape on a Body Slam, switch back to Chorizo on a Crunch, fly to waste more Body Slam PP, and get out of critical hit range from passive recovery. Then I just start going for Roost and Fly, making sure to not fly if Snorlax would die to a critical hit. Once Snorlax is down to his last few Body Slam PP, I start setting up again. Eventually, Snorlax just uses Rest, and then starts going for Sleep Talk. A Rest and Sleep Talk combination is actually really bad when used by AI, because Rest always causes a two-turn sleep. But the AI doesn't know that they'll wake up on that third turn, so they end up wasting a turn going for Sleep Talk on the turn that they're guaranteed to wake up. In other words, it's super safe to set up with Chorizo now. So, at plus 6, a Fly one-shot Snorlax. Azumarill is third but even a critical hit Aqua Jet won't kill us from full HP, so he goes down to a fly as well. Infernape is next and does some chip with Fake Out, but we obviously heal it back with passive recovery. Then we outspeed and kill him. Next is Heracross, who even with the Koba Berry, obviously goes down to plus six 100 base power stab fly. Borelum is last. He has a Focus Sash, which does let him survive a hit from fly, but he can't one-shot us from full HP without a ton of crits from Bullet Seed and he just chooses to go for Rock Tomb, which lowers our speed, but because of Rock Polish, we still outspeed, and one more fly kills Breloom, winning us the battle. Though sadly, it did cost us one chubby little mouse. Thanks for breaking the Water-type curse, Cheese. That's your legacy. So now, it's Crash or Wake time. This is a pretty tricky fight, because Wake's gym has permanent rain in it, meaning that his Water-types hit really hard. A few of them have Swift Swim as well. I decide to evolve Lollipop the Poliwag into a Poliwrath instead of a Politoed because Poliwrath has Water Absorb and we already have Drizzle support from Pepper. Water Absorb on Lollipop, along with his Water Fighting typing, is able to wall a good chunk of Crasher Wake's more scarier physical Pokemon. The idea here is to get rid of the permanent rain with Sunny Day from Eclair, bait out Ludicolo, stall him out of Energy Balls with Egg, switch to Lollipop, and then set up a Belly Drum Sweep. But as is often the case when I tell you my strategy before a battle even starts, it doesn't go exactly according to plan. Wake leads with Quag's Ire, and Eclair is able to immediately get rid of the rain with Sunny Day. The sun will only last for 5 turns, but after it expires, the rain won't be coming back. Then I start growling the Quag's Ire to lower his attack. Earthquake still does a lot of damage though, and a critical hit here could actually spell doom for our little French pastry. We get off a wish without a tragedy though. So, then I switch to Unagi, who has been pre-burned to trigger her Marvel Scale ability, which gives her a defense boost when afflicted by a status condition. This means that Earthquake doesn't do much damage, and Wish brings her back to full HP. 
Then I go for a Moonblast, which does just over 50% as Unagi takes a solid chunk from Earthquake. Leftovers gets us some HP back, but the burn does more damage than Leftovers recovers. So I heal up to full HP with Recover, and then Quagsire follows suit. So I hit him with another Moonblast as Quagsire hits Unagi with another Earthquake. We then repeat this over and over and over again. Recover, then Moonblast. Recover, then Moonblast. It takes forever. Eventually, I hit a critical hit Moonblast, which leaves Quagsire with a sliver. So, Wake uses a Hyper Potion, which is bad for reasons that I'll get to in a little bit. It also means that we're back to the Recover Moonblast cycle. Luckily, Quagsire isn't getting any critical hits at all. Eventually, he runs out of Earthquake PP and has to resort to Aqua Tail. But of course, he still has Recover, and Unagi is getting worn down from her burn. But, Unagi does manage to get another critical hit, which is certainly lucky. So, after what feels like forever, Quagsire falls. This brings in Ludicolo, as planned. So, I switch to Egg. Now, the issue with Ludicolo is that he has a Life Orb, which takes 10% of his HP every time he hits an attack. So, just plain stalling this thing out of energy balls doesn't work, because his Life Orb will actually kill him before he runs out of PP. This is where Wake using his Hyper Potion on Quagsire is a bit frustrating, because had he saved it, he'd certainly heal Ludicolo once he falls into the red, and we'd get a lot more turns to work with. The best I can do is use Minimize with Egg, so that Ludicolo hopefully misses attacks, since that wastes PP, but stops him from taking Life Orb Chip. I also set up Sunny Day so that he stops using Hydro Pump and hopefully starts going for Energy Ball, but it doesn't work. Ludicolo also misses basically no moves, so this isn't going super well. Another issue arises when Ludicolo runs out of Hydro Pump PP. See, the way the AI works in this scenario is that when the enemy Pokémon cannot use the move that should do the most amount of damage, instead of using the move that deals the second most amount of damage, it just randomly uses one of its other moves. So, because Ludicolo can't use Hydro Pump, which would deal the most amount of damage into Egg, he just randomly uses either Ice Beam or Energy Ball, even though Energy Ball obviously always does more damage because of Stab. So this plan was a bit ill-conceived from the start. I didn't actually know about this AI quirk until after this battle, though. It's clear that we aren't going to be able to stall Ludicolo out of Energy Ball PP, and I don't want Egg in when Wake's next Pokémon comes in. So, after captivating Ludicolo a bunch to lower his special attack, I decide to risk a crit and bring in Lollipop on his last turn of Life Orb Chip. He hits an Ice Beam, so Lollipop only takes 5 points of damage, but then Ludicolo actually survives with the sliver from the Life Orb Chip due to rounding, which is unideal. Ludicolo and Lollipop are speed tied, but I decide to risk it since an Energy Ball would only kill Lollipop if it crits. RNGesus answers my prayers and I end up winning the speed tie, so a Poison Jab takes out Ludicolo. This brings in Wake's own Polyrath, which sucks. I was expecting his Sharpedo because he knows Zen Headbutt, but I have no idea why Polyrath comes in. The best answer I can come up with is that the AI sees the Psychic type Hypnosis as super effective. I don't know. I switch to Unagi on a Hypnosis. Then I tank a critical hit Waterfall as Unagi goes for Recover, though we're running low on Recover PP. Then I hit Polyrath with a Tickle as a non-critical hit Waterfall does basically no damage. Then I go for a second Tickle. And after tanking a Waterfall, I use my last Recover PP to get back to almost full HP. This lets Unagi safely fire off two more Tickles, even after getting hit by another critical hit Waterfall. Then I switch to Quiche on a weak Waterfall. With a Choice Scarf, Quiche outspeeds and puts Polyrath to sleep by using Spore. Then I switch to Lollipop as Polyrath stays asleep. This lets me set up a Belly Drum to max out my attack stat. Fortunately, Polyrath continues to stay asleep. So we win yet another speed tie here, and a Drain Punch at plus 6 kills Polyrath in one shot and gets Lollipop back to almost full HP. Sharpedo comes out next and threatens with Zen Headbutt, so I switch to Eclair. And then from here, I switch between Eclair, who's immune to Zen Headbutt and baits Waterfall, and Lollipop, who's immune to Waterfall and baits Zen Headbutt. There's a lot of this type of PP stalling in this game if you want to play optimally, though obviously this fight is anything but optimal. After Sharpedo runs out of Waterfall and Zen Headbutt, he has to resort to Crunch, so Lollipop can get off a Belly Drum, but Crunch still does a bit too much damage, and now I'm risking her to a critical hit. But this battle is already so scuffed that I decide to just risk it, which ends up paying off since Crunch does not crit and Drain Punch brings Sharpedo down to his Sash. It also gains us back a ton of HP, so it is now completely safe to tank one more Crunch and then finish off Sharpedo's last hit point with another Drain Punch. 
Next is Gyarados, and yet again, I have to ask Lollipop to be clutch here. This time, it's hitting a Rock Slide. Gyarados goes for a Dragon Dance, and Lollipop connects, killing the Mighty Fish in one shot. This has been an absolutely amazing performance from Lollipop. Wake's Float Soul is last, but I can now just switch to Eclair on an Ice Punch. For no reason here, I risk Eclair to a critical hit from Aqua Tail, but I go unpunished, which lets me set up a fairly pointless wish. Then I switch to Lollipop, who gains some HP back from Aqua Tail, thanks to Water Absorb, and then gets back to full HP from Eclair's Wish. From here, a few Drain Punches finish off Float Soul and win us the battle. But I really did not deserve to win this fight deathless at all, and I am not particularly proud of how sloppy that was. At the very least, I'd like to think that it made me a better player, though. Anyways, it's now time to head off to Celestic Town, where my first confrontation with Cyrus awaits. Before leaving Pastoria City, I stop by the Safari Zone and against all odds manage to catch a Skaruppi named Lobster, who has battle armor. Steps before getting to Celestic Town, though, I have to face off against Dawn again, who has now become quite challenging. I really would like to show you this battle, but this video is already crazy long, so I need to cut it. But I do have to mention that against Dawn's final Pokemon, her Flareon, Sriracha the Infernape falls to a critical hit Flare Blitz. Losing an Infernape to a critical hit is kinda my specialty. Rest well Sriracha, you will be missed. Compared to Dawn, Cyrus is actually much easier since he only has 4 Pokemon. It's over pretty quickly, so no need to dwell on it. After that, there are 3 mandatory mini boss fights before I can take on Byron for badge number 6. The first is a battle against Castle Valley Derek and his Entei, which forces you to detour to Pal Park on Route 221. The second is a fight against Famine in Canalave City. And the third is a fight against Riley on Iron Island. All three of these fights are predominantly handled with careful setup sweeps from either Chorizo or Lobster. It takes a bit of positioning to pull it off without risking any critical hits, but all three of these battles go off without a hitch in more or less the same manner. I'm gonna skip them, but if you want to see them in detail, check out the highlights. Throughout the mini-boss gauntlet, I also get a ton of new encounters, but the only ones that are meaningful are a Relicanth named Cantaloupe from Celestic Town, and a Magnemity that I catch from the grass in front of Fuego Ironworks. I name them Batteries, and they quickly evolve into Magnazone. At some point, I also find a shiny Apom while thiefing some leftovers off of Munchlax and Honey Trees. So I replace the non-shiny Finger Food with our new shiny boy, also named Finger Food. He'll never be used though, sorry. This gets us to Byron, and try as Dreano might, even in a ROM hack, Byron is a total joke. All his Pokemon are slow and easily killed with a super effective special move. So there's like a dozen different ways to do this battle. Since I was kind of on a streak of using setup sweep strategies to beat the last few mini bosses, I decided to just set up another one here with Lobster. Byron leads with a Bronzong, whose only attacking move is Gyro Ball. So I lead with Salt, who sets up a Stealth Rock to break any Focus Sashes in the back. Bronzong then sets up a Stealth Rocks of their own. Then I switch to Omelette as Bronzong goes for a Reflect, which is perfect because Omelette is then able to Encore Bronzong into using Reflect. Then it's a switch to Lobster, who is free to set up three Swords Dances and max out her attack. Bronzong's Encore ends after I set up two Swords Dances, but he really can't do much damage to Lobster. So after all three Swords Dances, Lobster nails Bronzong with a Brick Break, which shatters their screens and also manages to crit for the one shot. So from here, it's all over. Steelix comes out, and an earthquake one-shots the Steel Snake. Well, that's not great. Remember the lesson I learned way back at the beginning of the video about not underestimating anything? Well, I guess I needed a refresher. I had assumed that plus 6 Earthquake would kill all of Byron's Pokémon without doing the calcs, but there was no reason to not check those calcs. This is completely my fault for being hasty and wanting to speed through Byron. R.I.P. Lobster, your tenure was short, but invaluable, even if it wasn't well shown in this video. I bring in Pepper who sets up the rain, and even after Byron uses a full restore, a rain boosted Surf takes out Steelix in one shot. Magnazone comes in next, so I switch to Chorizo on a Thunder Wave. After Poison Heal gets him back to full HP, an Earthquake easily takes out Magnazone. Agron is next, but also goes down to a times 4 super effective Earthquake. Fortress is 5th, and a bit scary since he knows Explosion, so I switch to Salt as Fortress just lays a layer of Toxic Spikes. 
Then we slowly take out Fortress with a few rock slides as he just lays down a few layers of spikes. It takes a while since Fortress has a Citrus Berry and Byron heals, but there's really nothing he can do. We can skip a few turns here. Last is Bastiodon, so I switch to Chorizo on a Metal Burst. In order to guarantee the kill, I set up a few sword stances since Bastiodon can only do very light damage with Iron Head unless we attack and he uses Metal Burst. So, after ensuring the kill, an Earthquake does indeed take him out, winning us the battle. I can't believe I lost a Pokémon to Byron. From here, Team Galactic sets off a bomb, which will lead to the inevitable climactic confrontation on top of Spear Pillar. There are a few mini-boss fights against Saturn and Mars here, but both are pretty easy. So the next step is to head to Snowpoint City and confront Candace. There's a mandatory double battle against these ace trainers that you have to do before Candace will challenge you, and this fight can be quite difficult. It ends up taking forever because many of their Pokémon like using Protect, but we do make it through in one piece. So it's Candace time. Her team likes to take advantage of her Obama Snow's permanent hail. So the first thing I do is lead with Pepper. You'll notice that Pepper isn't at the level cap. This is intentional so that Pepper will underspeed Candace's Obama Snow, meaning that her Snow Warning will activate first, and then Pepper's Drizzle will activate second and override it. But now, of course, Obama Snow does outspeed. So she hits a Blizzard. I was hoping she'd go for Wood Hammer. Either way, Pepper does have a Focus Sash here, so she was safe even to a crit. But without the Wood Hammer recoil damage, a Hurricane from Pepper misses out on the kill by just a sliver. So now I'm in a tough spot. Is Obama Snow going to go for the kill, or is Candace going to heal? If she heals, it's best to stay in and go for another Hurricane. But if she goes for the kill, then Pepper obviously dies if I stay in. So what do you think she does? Any guesses? After some deliberation, I decide that it's always safer to switch to Jawbreaker here, and Obama Snow does indeed go for the kill, though Blizzard now does pretty pitiful damage. Jawbreaker then outspeeds and hits Obama Snow with an Iron Head, which knocks her out. This brings in Weavile, but Jawbreaker is equipped with a Cobra Berry to half the damage of a super effective Dark type move, so we're safe to stay in and tank a Crunch. This lets Jawbreaker fire off an Iron Head that brings Weavile down to her Sash. And then on the next turn, a Priority Bullet Punch finishes off Weavile. Third is Mamoswine. She has a Pasho Berry here, so we need to be a little bit careful. I start by switching to Pepper on an Earthquake. Then I switch to Cantaloupe as he tanks an Avalanche. And thanks to Swift Swim, we can outspeed and hit Mamoswine with a Dive. Again, this won't kill because of Mamoswine's Pasho Berry, but in the rain, it still does a good chunk of damage. Cantaloupe is also holding a Shucka Berry, so he'd survive an Earthquake from Mamoswine, though for whatever reason, she's choosing to just use Avalanche. So, with one more Dive, which is at full power now that the Pasho Berry has been consumed, Mamoswine falls. All that's left for Candace is her Frostlass, her Glaceon, and her Walrein, all of which are special attackers. So it's egg time. Frostlass with Life Orb deals a ton of damage, so a freeze or a few consecutive crits would be pretty devastating, but fortunately she just goes down to a Toxic Stall without any problems. Glaceon is also scary because she's holding a Bright Powder and knows Double Team, but Egg is able to get off a Toxic before Glaceon's evasion gets too high, so she too goes down to a classic Toxic Stall. Again, a freeze would be bad here, but we do have a few Pokemon in the back that can tank Ice-type attacks if needed. Last is Walrein, who yet again we Toxic with Egg. To speed things up, I switch to Lollipop, who walls her pretty well. She does get hit by a Yawn, so we only get off one Drain Punch, which is softened by a Choppleberry, before she falls asleep. So I guess it's back to Egg, who with a few more turns of Toxic Stall, kills the Walrus, and wins us the 7th Gym Badge. With that, there's just a few more major fights before the Elite Four. But the next fight is easily the hardest fight so far. I'm talking about the multi-battle with my rival against Mars and Jupiter on top of Spear Pillar. In Vanilla Platinum, this fight is hard enough, since Mars and Jupiter's teams of three Pokémon apiece are decently strong, and your rival doesn't always make the best move choices. But in Renegade Platinum, obviously, it's much harder. Mainly because both Mars and Jupiter have full teams of six Pokémon meaning that this fight is a 12v12, and we've already seen that double battles become much more difficult and unpredictable when you can only control one Pokémon on your side of the field. Needless to say, I was terrified of this fight. I've never done anything like it, and it felt like a really large departure from anything you have to deal with in vanilla games, even with the most stringent of limitations. The sheer number of combinations of enemy pairs you have to prepare for makes building an optimal team of six really challenging especially if you've never done it before. 
I spent many, many days thinking about this fight and consulting with other ROMHack Nuzlockers like Drew and Moxie so that I could best plan out my team. Ultimately, I decided on a team of Skittles the Masquerade for Intimidate support, Unagi the Milotic who has been pre-burned to get a defense boost, Batteries the Magnazone who can take care of Mars and Jupiter's lead Crobats, Chorizo the Glysaur and Salt the Agron to act as bulky defensive tanks, and Eclair the Umbreon to deal with special threats and potentially provide wish support. This team had checks to most of Mars and Jupiter's Pokemon, but I'm gonna have to hope that Famine carries his weight at least a little bit and takes out a few of their Pokemon that we don't have perfect checks to. So, here we go. Mars and Jupiter lead with their two Crobats, as I lead with Skittles and Famine leads with Staraptor. An Intimidate from Skittles instantly drops both Crobats' attack stats. Both Crobats should also see the kill on Skittles with Brave Bird, meaning that they won't target Famine's Staraptor. This gives me a very safe switch into Batteries, who easily tanks both Brave Birds. Staraptor then fires off a Brave Bird into Jupiter's Crobat, knocking her out. This levels up Skittles and Batteries to level 59, since all my Pokémon have been edged to the next level. The level cap for this part of the game is 62 to match Volkner, but throughout the playthrough I've actually been using additional level caps for most of the major battles to make them a bit more challenging. So my Pokémon are actually level matched to Mars and Jupiter's aces. Anyways, Jupiter brings in Gastrodon next. I was hoping that Staraptor would have killed Saturn's Crobat, not Jupiter's, but oh well. Gastrodon threatens batteries with Earth Power, so I have to go for Magnet Rise here. Crobat then hits Famine's Staraptor with a hard Brave Bird, leaving him with a Sliver. He then retaliates with his own Brave Bird that takes them both out. Batteries gets off a Magnet Rise, and then gets hit by an Ice Beam which was presumably targeted at Staraptor before he went down. Electivire comes out second for Mars as Famine brings in Breloom. Electivire, who is part fighting type in this game, is one of the more difficult Pokémon for our team to face, so I was really hoping that Famine's Staraptor would be around to one-shot him with Brave Bird. I switched to Skittles to get off an Intimidate. Unfortunately, Electivire gets a critical hit Cross Chop, which bypasses the attack drop and brings Skittles down to his Sash. Breloom is then able to kill Jupiter's Gastrodon with two hits from Bullet Seed, which brings Skuntank out. And now we have a bit of an issue. Because Skittles is sitting at just 1 HP, both Skuntank and Electivire see a kill on him with all of their moves, meaning that they will go for a completely random move. This makes switching incredibly dangerous because I can't predict what move they'll use. And no, as far as I can tell, accuracy does not affect the AI's decision. It's completely random. I can protect for a turn, but Skuntank actually decides to go for the kill with Gunk Shot against Breloom, though he does survive thanks to a Focus Sash. But he gets poisoned. So after firing off a Force Palm into Skuntank, he goes down, and Azumarill comes out third. Which is a pretty odd decision on Famine's part, given who we're facing. But now, I have to make a tough decision. A switch just isn't safe. So I decide that Skittles needs to make a sacrifice here. He didn't get much screen time in this video, but he was very valuable in many fights that were cut for time as our only Intimidate user after Chicken went down. So it's really sad to see him go here. He does get off a Toxic into Electivire, and then Skuntank misses a Gunk Shot, but then an Ice Punch takes out the little bug. Thank you for your sacrifice, buddy. Azumarill is able to fire off a super effective Play Rough into Electivire for the kill, which is great, but it also makes Skittles' final move a bit meaningless. Oh well. I bring in Salt as Saturn brings in Bronzong. This Bronzong knows Earthquake, so I have to switch to Chorizo. A Gunk Shot from Skuntank cleanly knocks out Azumarill, bringing Famine down to three remaining Pokémon. And then Bronzong sets up a Stealth Rock, which is not ideal for switching. I guess they didn't want to Earthquake their teammate. Infernape comes in next for Famine, so he's able to Flare Blitz Bronzong for the one-shot, though because he takes a huge chunk of recoil damage, a Gunk Shot from Skuntank brings her kill count up to 3. Yanmega comes in next for Mars, as Famine brings in Heracross. Things are looking pretty bleak. I decide it's safe to stay in with Chorizo since Yanmega will want to kill Heracross, but Yanmega actually misses a Hurricane, which is amazing. It lets me get off an Aerial Ace into Yanmega, which does decent damage. Skuntank then hits a Play Rough into Heracross, but he survives, only to miss a Megahorn. Rough. But then Yanmega misses another Hurricane, so we can hit her with a Critical Hit Aerial Ace, which knocks her out. And then Skuntank misses a Play Rough, meaning that the most evasive Heracross in the world is able to kill Skuntank with a Megahorn. That was an insane stroke of luck there, and I think it actually gets us back into this fight. 
Though Skuntank's aftermath does kill Heracross, so now Famine is down to his last Pokemon Snorlax as Perugly and Bronzong come in. Fortunately, Snorlax is Famine's strongest Pokemon. Unfortunately, this Bronzong is special, so Chorizo isn't safe here. I go for a Protect, which apparently the AI reads into and doubles up on Snorlax with a Fake Out and a Swagger. That's not great. At this point, I really can't afford to be playing this passive. But on the next turn, I switch to Eclair as Snorlax tanks a Body Slam from Perugly and then hurts himself in confusion. Well, crap. Eclair is immune to a Psychic, so I called that right, but now Snorlax is going down and there's really nothing I can do to stop this from becoming a very scary 2v1. Eclair hits Perugly with a Toxic after Snorlax goes down, and then a redirected Psychic does nothing. Then I go for a Protect to get some more poison damage on Perugly. I decide to let Perugly hit me with a Play Rough on the next turn, which gets an attack drop. This lets me get off a Wish before Bronzong hits Eclair with a Swagger. Then I switch to Batteries, who shrugs off a Play Rough and a Flash Cannon, and then gets healed back to almost full HP with Eclair's Wish. Then it's a Protect to get more Toxic damage onto Perugly. From here, Perugly puts Batteries to sleep with a Hypnosis, though a Lumberry does heal us, so we get off a Thunderbolt into Bronzong. Unfortunately, Bronzong doesn't even take 50% from that, and then hits another Swagger. So Perugly goes down to Poison Damage, and now we're facing off against Mars's last Pokémon, her Kangaskhan which is just devastatingly difficult to deal with, especially next to Bronzong, who threatens our defensive tanks with Psychic, Flash Cannon, and Grass Knot. I switch to Unagi, who takes a good chunk from Fake Out and Psychic. I was hoping for a Hammer Arm from Kangaskhan that would have lowered her speed. Leftovers does heal back a bit of HP, but then Burn takes away a pretty good chunk. In this 2v1 scenario where I'm switching in on Stealth Rock's damage, the defense boost from the burn was absolutely not worth taking that much chip damage each turn from burn. This is bad. I switch back to batteries on a Body Slam and a Grass Knot. Then I go for a Protect, to stall out some PP and I guess to scout for moves. But at this point, I need to start making some sacrifices if I want to avoid a wipe. So, batteries falls to a Hammer Arm to get us a safe switch. Feels really bad to see Bronzong get back to almost full HP from leftovers here too. RIP batteries. I bring an Eclair here, which just isn't really all that great, because he's the only one of my remaining Pokemon that can kinda deal with Jupiter's Tangrowth that's still waiting in the back. But I have to risk him here. I go for a Protect to start. If I can somehow stall out Hammer Arm PP, Agron at least walls Kangaskhan, though Bronzong is obviously still a big problem. I go for a Toxic, but I miss. But then Kangaskhan actually misses a Hammer Arm as well. The sad thing is that if I had connected with that Toxic and then Kangaskhan missed, we'd actually be in a really decent position. But despite the Hammer Arm miss, this is pretty much over. There's nothing I can do but Toxic Kangaskhan and watch as our sweet beautiful Eclair falls to the double up. I've still got three Pokemon, but it's not looking great. I bring in Unagi and go for the very bad play of trying to recover stall the Kangaskhan until she dies of poison. But with burn damage and Grass Knot from Bronzong, it's just not possible. So I foolishly do one more recover here, and then Unagi goes down. I should have at least gone for damage on Kangaskhan, but honestly it doesn't really matter. Next I bring in Salt, and again Protect to get toxic damage onto Kangaskhan. Then I hit him with a Brick Break, but that's still not even enough to kill her, so a Hammer Arm and a Flash Cannon double up kill Salt. Kangaskhan finally falls, so now it's a 1v1, but Chorizo is all I have left, and he just takes too much damage from Bronzong Psychic, which also gets a special defense drop. Honestly, at this point, that's just rude. We do manage to kill Bronzong, but then Tangrowth comes out, and I have no way to break through this thing. I have Aerial Ace instead of Fly on Chorizo because I didn't want to be in a position earlier in the game where I was up in the air with Chorizo, as Famine killed a Pokémon, bringing in a new Pokémon that could then easily snipe Chorizo off once he came back down. But here, that obviously bites me in the ass, since Aerial Ace just isn't enough damage. Fly would also give me another turn of passive recovery, which could make this doable. You know, assuming Bronzong didn't get that special defense drop with Psychic. So unfortunately, despite his best efforts, Chorizo falls, and I wipe, marking the end of Attempt 1 of Renegade Platinum. The fact of the matter is that my plan for this 12v12 just wasn't that great. I did put a lot of thought and effort into planning my team, but there were still a lot of holes and major threats that I didn't have reliable checks for. I think overall my team was too passive and I played a little too conservatively. The end of the battle was pretty sloppy too. 
Pre-burned Unagi was just a bad bring, and I don't think that the Intimidate from Skittles was worth using up one of my six team slots. When wiping in a Nuzlocke, it's easy to wallow and think about all the times that RNG didn't go your way. Missed attacks, low rolls, untimely crits, unpredictable AI, and there's a level of self-pity that is valid and cathartic. But it's always more important and more constructive to think about what you could have done better and what you learned from the loss. So ultimately, that's what this is. A learning experience. Am I bummed that I couldn't do Renegade Platinum in one attempt? Yes. Absolutely. If you don't think I threw myself a two-day pity party, you would be very wrong. But ultimately, when I reflect on the attempt and look back at the footage, I'm still really happy with how far I got in just one attempt. It was by no means perfect, but I truly think that this experience made me a far better Nuzlocker than the dozens of monotype playthroughs on vanilla games ever have. And I was honestly really surprised by how quickly I was ready to get back on the horse and start attempt two. Even with documentation, playing through a game for the first time is significantly harder than doing it a second time. The jump in comfort and confidence that you can get from the first to second playthrough of a game cannot be understated. And after going through the footage, the difference between how I played in attempt one and future attempts is night and day to me. I'm so excited to share attempt two and beyond with you all, so I really hope you check out my next video. For now though, thank you so much for watching. I'm so thankful for everyone who's supported my content throughout this last year or so, and I'm excited to be branching out into more ROM hacks and other types of challenges. If you enjoyed watching this monster of a video, please like the video and subscribe. Or don't, I don't know, but I do know that you should follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future challenges. You should also subscribe to my highlights channel to get highlights of the challenge I'm currently streaming before it's cut down to a video on the main channel. And be sure to join the Flag on HG community discord where you can discuss nuzlocking and contribute to future challenges. The links are in the description below. Stay tuned for more nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.